you have a Bible, you can turn to Psalm 119. We'll be looking at verse 162. We're here at church, and so I think you agree with me when I say that God's word is worth it. It's worth anything that it requires of us, the time, the energy, the focus that we need, because it's going to deliver something to us that we need. It's going to change our character, mold us and shape us, but mostly it's going to bring us directly to God himself. But sometimes it seems like we miss out on these great spiritual blessings that the word has for us because of different reasons, and maybe we have a bad attitude and we, we never even open the Bible because of that attitude, or maybe our attention is distracted towards other things, or maybe the action that we have towards God's Word is one of laziness instead of passionate getting into it. Now, a few years back in Israel, there were two leading archaeologists along with 15 paid workers that had been digging for over a year in a parking lot outside of the old city in Jerusalem. They were a little frustrated. They just really knew something was there, but they couldn't get to it, but they had to be patient. They're archaeologists. They're patient. And then a volunteer came from Britain. Her name was Nadine Ross. She paid her own way to be there, started digging. She was ready for her Indiana Jones adventure. And three weeks after she arrived, she unearthed one of the most impressive hordes of ancient Byzantine gold coins, 264 gold coins she found, and they had found nothing significant before that. The Israel Antiquities Authority said it was the largest, most impressive find of its kind. The next largest find for ancient Byzantine gold coins was just five coins. And so they were blown away. But she wasn't as shocked because that's why she came. She's like, of course, I came here to, to have an adventure and dig in the ground and find some gold. And these other people are like, we're not even paying you. You're just a volunteer and you find the gold. She thought it was normal, and I think that comes across in her quote when somebody asked her, how'd you find the treasure? And she said this, and I'll quote her exactly. We moved some big rocks out of the way, and I dug underneath, and there it was. <laughs> ah. The archaeologists were writing, ah, that's what we were doing. Wrong. <laughs> it sounds so simple, but if those big rocks weren't moved out of the way first, then they never would have found that gold. And that's what I want to explore with you today. I think spiritually maybe there's some big rocks that are in our way when it comes to getting into God's Word, and it prevents us from receiving that rich spiritual treasure that God has for us. So we're going to look at some ways to remove these stumbling blocks as we examine my favorite verse in the Bible, Psalm 119, 162, which says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So first, we'll look at the, the big rocks that are in our way in the first three parts of that verse. I rejoice. This is the attitude that we have towards Scripture. If we have a bad attitude towards Scripture instead of rejoicing, that's going to be an obstacle that we need to get out of the way, or we're never even going to crack open the Bible because of our attitude. The next phrase in that verse is, at your word. And this shows us the attention that we should have directed at Scripture, if our attention is distracted somewhere else outside of the Bible, then we're going to miss out on what God has for us. We're going to be digging and looking for satisfaction in the wrong places. And the next phrase says, as one who finds. This is the action that is required by Scripture. Hard work. If we're lazy, that's another big rock that we've got to get out of the way and overcome that because if we get past these three big rocks that are in our way, we arrive at the last part of Psalm 119, 162, great treasure, and this is the attraction of Scripture, that there's great treasure awaiting us. And so the treasure is our goal, and it is well worth overcoming these three big obstacles to arrive at it. So let's pray, and then we'll look at the first one, I rejoice. Father, we give this time to you, and we ask that you would speak through your word, that your Holy Spirit would impress upon all of us the truths of your word, and that you would inspire us to live out your word after we receive it. And so would you please speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. So the first big rock, I rejoice the attitude that we have towards Scripture. We're told by the psalmist about 100 chapters earlier in Psalm 1910, more to be desired are they than gold. Yes, more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So when describing the Scriptures, the psalmist sees them as precious like gold and silver and sees them as sweet to taste like honey and the honeycomb. Now, it's easy to rejoice in certain obvious situations in life. One day, all of a sudden, I heard these words, it's a girl. 
after nine months of waiting and not finding out what gender our baby was, all of a sudden the doctor says that and my wife and I just start bawling our eyes out. This cute little princess looks at us and now she's a beautiful little terrible too. Naughty little girl, but she's beautiful. Another phrase that I heard, real simple, that changed my life was worth rejoicing over and it was, yes. And that's after I asked my wife if she'd marry me. I'm like, you, you're kidding, really? Huh. You dribble, you shoot, you hope for the best, and sometimes I mean, that, that was, that was life-changing happiness right there. You'll spend the rest of your life with me? That's a reason to rejoice. But why the scriptures? Why are we told to rejoice in God's word? Well, if you've ever been to a hotel, you can thank the Gideon organization for placing a Bible in there, and they have a really cool description of the word of God designed to entice people to open it up and begin reading. The Gideons wrote this about the Bible. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven open, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully, because it is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. What a great description of the word that you guys hold in your hands right now. In fact, the Bible describes itself that it contains all things that pertain to life and godliness. I mean, within the covers of this book, we've got the answer to all of life's great questions, everything that we need. If we realize one day that we're just worried, we're, we are so concerned, it's stressing us out, we see in the scriptures that we can cast our cares upon God because he cares for us. And if we feel really tempted to, to give in to a sin, we see in the scriptures that there's always going to be a way of escape that the Lord provides. And if we just feel upset and we're just sad and depressed and we're grieving, we see in the Bible that God puts our tears in a bottle. He notices those things, but one day he's also gonna wipe away those tears. And so the scriptures have everything that we need, but for the very best reason, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. And we're talking about rejoicing in the word, and yet we're going to now look at the weeping prophet. This is the guy who we don't see much fruit or success in his ministry and worldly standards, but, but the Lord asked him to do some stuff, and he did everything that he was commanded to do. And yet his result was always being thrown in prison. They were decide, deciding whether or not they should even give him a ration of bread or not. And we don't see many people listening to what he has to say. Instead, they're burning up scrolls he's writing. And this is the guy who wrote Lamentations and just sat there weeping as Israel or Jerusalem was just on fire. And yet he found a reason to rejoice, and it was in God's word. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he says this, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So why do we rejoice in the word? It's within the scriptures that we find the true goal of, of much of the Bible that God doesn't hate us. God's not angry at us. In fact, even though we are sinners, God has provided a way for our sins to be atoned. We learn in the scriptures that we are loved by God. Jeremiah said, for I am called by your name. That's why there was a joy and rejoicing in his heart. Life can be tough. There's no guarantee it would be wrong to guarantee you that life gets easier after you become a Christian. That's not true at all, except for the fact that God now walks with you, that the Spirit of God is living inside of you to comfort you, to give you strength, to give you someone that you can cast your cares upon. And we're called by his name. We're adopted into his family, born into his family. But what about those days where you just don't feel a joy in your heart about the Scriptures? What do you do during those times? It just doesn't feel that way. Well, I have a little daughter. 
And I'll tell you what, she feels like eating cotton candy for breakfast. She feels like even if she stubs her toe, she deserves an ice pop, um, just because we did that once. So now every little time she gets hurt a little bit, she wants an ice pop. You know, patients don't feel like they should be taking their medicine all the time, but that can really mess them up if they stop taking their medicine. If I make all my decisions based on my feelings, then I've already lost. That's no way to make a decision because feelings are up and down all over the place. For me, it was like driving into New York City from New Jersey. And when you're driving in, you have to get in through a tunnel or a bridge. And so I would normally go in through the Holland Tunnel. They'd take about 60 or so lanes, merge them into one lane to get through the tunnel in the process of about four or five feet that merge happens. So it's just about impossible. So everybody is passionately, I mean, nice little old grandmothers are like vehemently merging in and, and getting themselves into the right place. So if you want to actually get to New York City at some point, you roll the windows up, put the music on, put some sunglasses on and pretend like, I don't see you. I don't see the cars next to me. Because if you look over at them, you've already lost. If you look over right or left, the way that their face looks, you know they're either going to guilt you into it or murder you, both which you don't want. And so you just ignore them and you just slowly inch forward, get into everyone else's lane, and eventually you're in the city. It's the same thing with our emotions. If we, make, if we say, I'm going to make my decisions based on how I feel, then we've already lost. That's no way to be making decisions. Our feelings come and go. God's word endures forever. And it's a common temptation of Satan to make us give up reading the word when our enjoyment of the word is gone. You have to ask the whole chicken and egg question, what comes first, the joy for reading the scriptures and so I read, or do I read the scriptures and then eventually I have a joy? And it's the latter. If we take time and commit to reading God's word, then eventually we will have a joy as we read God's word. For me, that's exactly what happened with coffee. I remember having coffee in middle school because I was trying to impress this girl. She's like, you like coffee? I'm like, of course I like coffee because I like girls. And so... I uh, had my sip of black coffee as a middle schooler, and I did everything I could not to spit it all over the place. I pretended to have a couple sips and say, oh, I'm actually in a hurry. I gotta, gotta go. This, I didn't have coffee for four years after that because of how bad that coffee tasted. And then there was another girl that I had to impress. And so four years later, you know what? It's worth it. And so I have coffee again, and then I had it again, and then I had it again. And now I'm just like you. I'm addicted. I have way too much. I really enjoy coffee too much, uh, even at the expense of health or anything. And so it's exactly like that with the reading of scriptures is that you may not have a joy in your heart about reading the Bible. When you wake up, I don't, I don't wake up. Maybe you wake up like this. I mean, maybe, but I don't wake up. Hallelujah. God, let's do this. I wake up and one of my eyes is like stuck shut. I have to pop it open and I'm not thinking about God's word for a few minutes. Right? And then I have to put on Christ. And then I have to say, Lord, I'm exhausted, but I want to get in to your word. And then if I keep doing that, the joy comes, and then it becomes a priceless time that I can't live without. And so the first part of Psalm 119, 162 is that obstacle we have to overcome, shown by I rejoice, and that's the attitude that we have towards Scripture. The next phrase we have is at your word. And this is the attention that we should focus on scripture. A few years ago, there was another type of a treasure hunt going on in Jerusalem. There was a nice lady named Anat. Her mother had rarely gone on vacation. They finally, the family convinced her to go on a week vacation. During that time, she said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace mom's mattress. She's had it for 40 to 50 years. This thing is just nasty. It probably hurts her back. So when she comes back, she's like, oh, it was a great vacation. She's like, mom, look, we got you a mattress. It's got buttons and it's soft. And her mother starts screaming at her. What have you done? Where is it? Mom, why are you? It's going to be fine. I, I threw it out a few days ago. You stole it, didn't you? You stole it. What are you talking about? Her mother had hidden a million dollars in that mattress, and it was thrown out a few days earlier. Anat, realizing that was in her, her inheritance, now gone, sprinted to the local landfill. As she was running there in a panic, somebody said, are you okay? She goes, I threw up my mother's mattress, and there was a million dollars hidden in it. She goes, They're really? So they, they all start running with her. By the end of the day, the news was reporting from all of the local landfills, not even just in Tel Aviv, but all, a bunch of different ones. People were waist deep in filth, in hummus, olives, that's St. Peter's fish, anything Israeli that you could imagine, right? They're waist deep in this stuff, 
cutting open all the mattresses looking for the money. And they all came home looking filthy with nothing to show for it because it was lost or uh, smartly found and not told that somebody found it is probably what happened. So the money was never found. And you know what this reminded me of was that sometimes we look for treasure in the trash, don't we? Sometimes we say, I just don't feel satisfied. I feel bored. And we have that thought of maybe I'll read the Bible, maybe I'll pray. But instead, we think, you know what will satisfy me? A rerun. Uh, watching something that I've already seen, I already know the outcome, that's going to satisfy me. Or just browsing around on the internet, that'll, that'll be a good way to kill this time. Or whether it's a movie, music, looking at your phone, playing some games, whatever it is, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with neutral downtime, but we know the difference between when God is stirring our heart to do something for the kingdom, for our soul, and just vegging out. And I think that you'd all agree with me that we need to make this our prayer. And that's Psalm 119, 37. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. I have a personal rule in life that if anybody on Facebook sends me an invite to play Farmville, they're automatically blocked and never to be friends in real life or online. That's the epitome of a wasted time. I'm going to create a fake farm that I can't eat the food. Instead of going to a farmer's market, I'm going to do this. And so... Whatever that means to you, I, I say you should all adopt the same policy and we'll get rid of that thing. Now, we tend to focus on what will satisfy us immediately, don't we? And that makes sense. That makes sense, especially to our flesh, right? We, we, we want a song. It's amazing in today's culture. You think of a song, you can pay for it and download it within less than a minute. You can actually have that song. Same thing for books. and It's, it's cool, and yet it causes us to live in this kind of microwave, kind of instant satisfaction type of a society. And we bring that to the Word of God, and we expect that, you know, we should find some results like that. Peter and John bumped into somebody who just wanted immediate satisfaction. They didn't have any bigger plans than that. In Acts chapter 3, in verse 30, Peter stumbled upon a man who was lame. He couldn't walk, and he just looked at Peter and said, can I have some money? And that was his best case scenario was that he would get some silver or gold so that he could buy some food and live another day. That's best case scenario for him. Peter looks at him, sensing the Holy Spirit wants to do something, maybe sensing some faith. And Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. So he's like, oh, good, somebody noticed me. Maybe puts his hand out for a coin. That's what he thinks best case scenario is. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he did. That's not what he was expecting. But doesn't our God give us greater things than we expect or even ask for? Things greater than we could ever ask for or think of is what the Lord has for us. And if we could just start to fall more in love with spiritual blessings rather than material blessings, then our life would have a whole different focus. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 that there are spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. They're just there for the taking. We hear people a lot say, ah, the Lord blessed me with a car. The Lord blessed me with tuition. The Lord blessed me. And it's always followed by a material provision. But more often, we need to be saying things like, the Lord has blessed me with a spirit inside of me. God has sealed me. I've been redeemed. I've been elected. I've been predestined in recognizing these spiritual gifts that we've been given. And we've got to find our joy in that because the material world changes, right? This life goes from Putin's going to invade and kill us all. North Korea's trying to attack us all. Ebola's going to get us all. I mean, life changes. It goes from seasons where things feel okay to seasons that are bad all the time. God's spiritual blessings are always available in those times. In fact, the psalmist says, you've magnified your word above your name. And so we should seek God in his word. But we all have the same excuse and it's a good one, right? We say, I don't have enough time. I just don't have enough time, you know, with work, with kids, with family. The truth is we all have 168 hours, don't we, each week. We all have 168 hours. We do make time for what's important. Even when we're running late, we'll grab a power bar or a bowl of cereal or something, but sometimes we starve our soul. If, if we're too busy to read the scriptures, that's not the end result of the conversation. We should recognize we're just too busy, we need to change careers. We need to get up earlier. We need to redeem the time at lunch or in the car. 
But the wrong answer is just to leave it at, I'm just too busy. That's never gonna be enough. We need to always fit Christ in to the main part of our day and everything else fits in around him. Do you know that to read the entire Bible or to have the Bible read to you, I should say, by an audio Bible is only 72 hours. That's a weekend, right? I have to sleep a bit, so maybe a, a week or so. But whether you read slow or not, that's the Bible read to you. It's about 72 hours, most of the, the Bibles that are audio out there. If you wanted to read the New Testament, it would just take 13 to 15 hours and a big pot of coffee and one crazy day. And I'll have some bloodshot eyes the next day, but grateful eyes. You know, reading the Bible is just reading four chapters a day, and you read through the entire Bible in a year. Four chapters a day is less than 20 minutes of reading. Even at a slow speed, it's 20, 25 minutes of reading. And every year, you cover the Bible, every single year. If you just want to start smaller than that, just read one chapter a day of the New Testament, and you'll get through the entire New Testament in a year and have 100 makeup days. So you can sleep in 100 days and be like, oh, I forgot. And as long as you don't do that more than 100 times, you'll still read the entire New Testament in a year. You're like, now that's my plan. Now, you know me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we need that. But still, what a great goal to read the entire New Testament in a year. And so we've got distractions that are pulling us away from this time. Some things that we can shed and get rid of to have more of a focus in life. And we can seek first the kingdom of God and have these other things that are necessary added to us. You know, anything that gets between us and Jesus is a bad thing, whether it's a person, a habit, a possession, whatever it is, if it gets between us and God, then it's a bad thing. If this stops being a tool, right now I have a, a stopwatch on it to make sure I don't go long, so it's a tool for Christ right now, right? You're grateful for that too, I know. Um, if this stops becoming a tool and becomes an idol in my life, then I've got to chuck it and go back to some old phone that has some dinosaur dust on it, you know? And if that means that I can focus on God more, we've got to get rid of distractions. In Hebrews, it says, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We're really not as busy as we say we are. We can always find some more time. If you like biographies, then you've read George Mueller, the, the, guy, the man of faith that started the orphanages overseas. He said this, after having read the Bible through 100 times with increasing delight, he made this statement. I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the word of God. Friends often say, I have so much to do, I cannot find time for scripture study. Perhaps there are not as many who have more to do than I. I've had annually about 30,000 letters as a pastor of church of 1,200 believers, a lot to respond to. Besides that, I'm in charge of five huge orphanages and we print millions of tracts, books, and Bibles, but I have always made it a rule never to begin work until I've had a good season with God and his word, and the blessing I have received has been wonderful. This is the theme that you can trace back to all great men and women of God. It's that they were men and women of the word and of prayer. We've got to make time for it. And if we don't, it should be noticeable to us, and I think it is, um, if you've ever gone a day or a few days without food, you notice that your strength begins to diminish a bit. And if we go days without the word of God and we don't have an appetite for the word of God at all, then that shows us there's a problem. There's a spiritual sickness. For me, it's coffee. Now that I'm addicted, I want it all the time, right? And, but if I pick up coffee in the morning and I say, mm, I'm not feeling like it, that's my first clue that I'm sick. Literally, that's the one thing I just don't have a taste for. And I know I'm probably not feeling very well. And so... With God's word, we have to have an appetite for it. And if, and if Sunday is enough and the rest of the week we don't have a desire to be getting, it's one thing to have a desire to be in the word and then you're slipping up or things are getting busy and then at night you're like, oh, I didn't get into the word today, but you have a desire for it. That's one thing. But if you don't even have a desire to be in the word, then there's a spiritual disease. That's not normal. If God's spirit is living inside of us, then we're gonna start having his desires as well. And so it doesn't mean we're reading the Bible three hours a day, but it does mean there should be a desire for us to get into the scriptures. So it should be noticeable to us because it's definitely noticeable to other people. If you go a day or two without bathing, it doesn't apply to you since we've dismissed the high schoolers. It applies maybe more, more to them. But you know, people start to notice that. You start to stink. And you go too long without reading the scriptures and you begin to stink spiritually. You better believe it. The smallest little thing will be a frustration and you kind of snap at somebody and you get really stressed out and everyone's like, what's going on with you? This isn't really a big deal. It's just a small thing causes you to react in a big way because you haven't been connecting with the Lord enough. 
And yet on the other side of it, if you're connecting with the Lord a lot, life's biggest trials can come and you're ready for them. Thankfully, my wife and I had a great season in the scriptures about four years ago. Uh, she was 12 weeks pregnant, and we went there just for a great, we're out of the, we're out of the danger zone, 12 weeks. We go to the, the doctor, and they can't find the heartbeat. And at first, I'm like, don't worry, sweetie, it's fine. I know how nervous she's starting to get. And they can't find the heartbeat at all. They had to send us home for three hours until the ultrasound specialist came in to be able to show one way or another what, what had happened. During that time, we're bawling our eyes out to the Lord, begging him to have mercy on us. But because we were in the scriptures, we were trying to respond to God biblically as well. And so every plea for our child's life also ended with, but Lord, we know you're good either way. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We didn't want to have to quote that verse. You better believe it. We didn't want that at all. My wife passed out from exhaustion from crying so much. And we go back to the doctor we had lost our baby. Our baby had been born again, even before being born. So we named our baby. God was kind to meet us. We named our baby Enoch Nahum Dean, the kind of name you get beat up for in fourth grade on earth, but in heaven you don't get beat up. <laughs> Enoch walked with God and was not because the Lord took him, and Nahum 1.7 says the Lord is good. And within 15 minutes of, of losing our child, the Lord had even given us a name that represented what had happened. We wouldn't have been ready. And we had four months of grief after that that was really difficult, but, you know, we, we, we stuck with the Lord because he deserved it, not because of what he gives us, because of who he is. And that's because we were in the Bible every day. And now God has blessed us with a little Crabigail, we call her sometimes, because she's in such a mood, Crabigail, and little Gideon now we have also. So God is good all the time. Other people notice these things. If we're not careful to examine our lives in this area, then like Jesus said, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and they choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So we've got to examine where our attention is. Is it focused on Scripture? The next part of Psalm 119, 162 is our third rock, our third obstacle that we've got to get out of the way before we get to the treasure. And it's the phrase, as one who finds. And this is the action that's required of us in Scripture. That action is hard work, and the boulder is laziness that we have to move out of the way. A friend of mine in college scratched away the last part of a lottery ticket. It was his birthday and discovered, and this is a true story, that he won $50,000 as a poor college student. But his reaction surprised me. Instead of talking about all the things he was going to buy himself, he began to talk about being generous. He said, oh, my sister's getting married in two weeks. They wanted to go to this, on this cruise for their vacation, but they're just going to stay in this hotel locally. I'm going to buy them the cruise tickets. Oh, my mom's always wanted to do this in the house. I'm going to do He talked about spending every single penny for other people to bless them. He was so excited. I felt horrible because I had bought him that lottery ticket for his birthday. I'd given it to him. So you're thinking, maybe, maybe I felt so horrible because I was jealous of all the money, but it's much worse than that because he would soon turn the ticket over to read, to redeem, please contact the tooth fairy. It was a prank because I thought he was going to be selfish like me. And so I thought he was going to, then it would be funny because, ah, now you're not getting the cool car, ha, ha. But no, it was horrible. All of his dreams of helping his family were now shattered. We're not even Facebook friends anymore. We're not even, let alone real life. Oh, my goodness. I didn't mean to teach him this lesson. I was just trying to be a punk friend, you know. Uh, but the lesson is, if it's too good to be true, then it probably isn't true. And we, we sometimes think that if we just open the Bible for a few seconds, oh, I've got a minute before I have to leave to work, we open the Bible, read a couple of verses, that all of a sudden the Shekinah glory is going to surround us and this cloud is going to fill our home and, oh, the Lord is here. Wow, 30 seconds, I beat my record. This is the quickest God's ever spoken to me. You know, and there's devotional books out there called, you know, Daily Devotions in Less Than a Minute. And you're like, oh, that's, that's fantastic. Seven minutes a week that you, even though you were created for fellowship with God, you got it down to seven minutes a week. Good job. And so... You know, it's not, the, it's not the case with the scriptures. You can't just open the Bible, 30 seconds later, slam the staples button. That was easy. It's, it's, it's very different than that. We have to take time to get into the scriptures, and it requires hard work, but the blessing is a great payoff. So you have to ask, do you read the Bible in a hurried way? Just a little tidbit here or there, and then off you go. Or maybe like me, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you move, you move down the page, you change paragraphs, you even flip the page over, and then you realize, I've been daydreaming the whole time. 
How is that even possible? I remember flipping pages and moving through it, but the whole time I've been thinking about this thing or this worry in my life that I have to do. Sometimes you show up at work or at home and you realize, I don't remember driving, but I'm here and I'm alive. What? Oh my. And we can multitask. We're built to multitask. You don't want to multitask when you're in the scriptures. You have to be fully focused on them. You're never going to get comfort for your soul out of that which you don't understand. You might as well read a Greek New Testament manuscript without knowing Greek and feel accomplished because you didn't understand that. And if we read in the English and don't understand, it doesn't count. We've got to back up and start over and keep reading. Proverbs tells us to search for wisdom as for hidden treasure. We know how we'd search for hidden treasure. How do we search for wisdom like that? Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 30. We see a good example of this. I think I said Acts 30, I meant Acts 8. Some of you should have gotten to Acts 28 by now and been questioning yourselves, but. (laughs) Acts chapter 8, verse 30. There's an Ethiopian eunuch, as he's called in the scriptures, and he had a copy of the Isaiah scroll, and he was seeking God, and he was reading it and trying to figure out, and Philip was doing great ministry, and the Holy Spirit just said to him, go to the desert. And he obeyed, and he went to the desert and saw this chariot, and the Holy Spirit says, overtake the chariot. And he goes up, and it says in verse 30, Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. They began to read a portion of Isaiah 53 together, and he says in verse 34, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? We see three things here that the Ethiopian eunuch did to get into the scriptures and show that he was working hard to find out the truth. The first is that he was reading and rereading. He was even reading out loud. Philip, in verse 30, came up to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Sometimes when you're distracted, you just read the Bible out loud and it helps you to focus a bit more. And so this guy is reading the scriptures, rereading them, meditating on it, just really trying to get everything that he can out of the word and just keeps on reading it. The second thing he does is that he asked Philip for help. He wasn't too prideful to think he could figure it out on his own. When he saw Philip, he said, yes, how can I figure out what this means unless somebody guides me? And we live in a great day with lots of resources. There's, there's websites out there that you can access some commentaries for free. You can look at multiple translations of the scripture to compare one another. You can buy some great resources. You can podcast messages for free. And there's pastors here on staff at Reliance that would love to talk to you about the Bible. If you came up and said, I don't mean to bother you, but I have a question about the Bible. Would you mind talking? They'd be like, yes. Or this is fantastic. You're reading the Bible and you have questions. And it doesn't mean they're a Bible dictionary themselves, but they're going to know how to go about researching the answer. And they're going to love that conversation they have with you. So ask people for help or use the resources that are available. And finally, we see this guy He asked questions, specific questions about what he was reading. Is this prophet saying this about himself or I'm sensing he's talking about someone else? And we should be doing the same exact thing. Three simple questions you can ask. What, so what, now what? And that'll help you move from reading the scriptures to studying them a bit and even applying them. What's going on here? What are all the facts? What am I looking at? What's the context? So what? So what does this mean What does this mean? What did the author really originally intend to say to that original audience? And now what? Now what does God require of me now that I know his heart, his truth? How can I be a doer of the word, not a hearer only? What's the Ethiopian eunuch doing here? Well, he's working hard at understanding the scriptures. He knew something was missing, so he kept on reading. He read out loud. He asked somebody for help. He began asking questions about the text. He was diligently seeking. Hebrews 11.6 says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's a promise we have. If we're willing to take time and say, you know what, I'm shutting the TV off, I'm getting up early when my family's not up, and I'm going to spend time in the scriptures, I've got a pen in my hand, I'm expecting God to speak to me, and we diligently search as best as we know how, then God will reward us with that, right? If we draw near to him, then he's going to draw near to us. To diligently seek means to search carefully, to investigate, to crave, to demand an answer. And this is what the Ethiopian eunuch was doing. He wouldn't rest until he had the answer. And God rewarded him, definitely. By by God's spirit, 
this was rewarded by sending Philip there with the correct answers, and he received salvation and was baptized. We really don't have an excuse for not working hard. God has given us resources, abilities personally. We have a stewardship over our lives. We can work hard. There's a man that you don't know. His name's William McPherson, and he lived in the early 1900s, and he worked at a mine. And one day there was an explosion that he wasn't ready for, and the explosion uh, burned his eyes. He went blind forever, and it blew off his two hands, and he had to have some fake hands put on. Now, he was a new believer, and so God's word was really important to him, and now he was living in a world of physical darkness and started to almost sense spiritual darkness because he couldn't read the Bible like he used to. He begged the nurses to read, but eventually they had to go on. Visitors would read, but eventually they had less of a tolerance than, than him, and they wanted to move on, and he was left in darkness. So he prayed and prayed, but he couldn't learn Braille because he didn't have hands anymore. And so what William McPherson did was he ordered some Braille tablets because he heard that somebody in England learned how to read Braille using their lips. And so he had the Braille tablets brought over. They were hung in a picture frame right in front of him. He pressed his lips up against it, but his lips had been seared so much in the blast that he couldn't feel anything and couldn't learn. He tried for days, crying his eyes out to the Lord, and then eventually as he tried again with his lips, his tongue touched the Braille by accident, and he got an idea that had never happened before, and he began to teach himself Braille using his tongue. He would stay up all night just to learn one new letter of the alphabet. His tongue would be sore and bloody, and he would need to take a few days off for his tongue to to heal and build up the scar tissue it needed. And do you know that eventually he taught himself how to read using his tongue? And in the 65 years after that accident that he was alive, that he spent in darkness, he read through the entire Bible four times just using his tongue. That's actually a true story. I did some bonus research this week and found it in a popular science uh, magazine in 1921. You know, and and I, it's, it shows me that I have no excuse. Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed because it's a little chilly because I didn't set the temperature the right way. Or, oh, my coffee machine broke yesterday, so why get out of bed and meet with the Most High, you know, if it can't be with my cup? And so, you're like, he really is addicted. <laughs> um, why was it worth that much pain? Because William McPherson knew that if we got over these three obstacles, having a bad attitude, having an attention that is distracted, and having actions that are lazy, if we could overcome those three big rocks that are in our way, we arrive at the great treasure. So the last part of Psalm 119, 162 is great treasure, the attraction of Scripture. Now, we're attracted to Scripture, the shine of a gold coin, the sparkle of a diamond. What kind of a treasure can we expect to find in the Word of God? Well, somebody rephrased Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10, like this, and it really does a good job of describing the treasure in the Word. The revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. You'll like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red, ripe strawberries. Now, it's important to see, like the psalmist, the word of God as a great treasure because Jesus said, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And if we can learn to value the word of God, then our heart's going to be there, and that's where we're going to put our time and energy behind. Now, my my wife Shannon likes her engagement ring more than just because it's a nice diamond she likes. One one day when we were dating, I saw a piece of note paper on my my desk, and it said, princess cut. I was like, oh, I guess... I guess she wants to get like a little Snow White haircut with some bangs or something. Yeah, you look great, sweetie. She's like, it's not a haircut. I had no idea what she was talking about. She goes, it's a style of diamond. I was like, okay, oh, all right. I guess my attempts at wooing you are succeeding, you know? All right, that felt good to get that kind of a note. But it's not just that it's a beautiful $50 diamond. That's not, (laughs) should I have spent more? Uh. It's the message behind the diamond. You see, when my wife and I were engaged, we were 3,000 miles apart. She was in the most desirable county in America, Orange County. I was in New Jersey. Um, So she would get sad, not only that she had to move to New Jersey and prep for the pollution and everything. She got sad because we were so far apart. And when she was sad, I would tell her, hey, look down at that ring. There's a time coming where I'm coming for you. Your fiance is coming soon. There's a date that we have the wedding set. And 
you know what, we're going to be together forever. And so that's what the diamond reminded her of, is that the wedding was coming soon. Now, what I want you to see today is that the Bible is a treasure because it reminds us that the bridegroom of Jesus is coming back for his church. He hasn't forsaken us. He's sealed us with the Holy Spirit. He's given us the down payment of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that he is coming back for us. The attraction is the written word can take us to the living word. That's the great treasure of the scriptures. Jesus said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. And so we need to find Jesus in the word. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, he bumped into two disciples. This is after his death and resurrection. So the rumor of the resurrection was, was going around, but these two disciples, they just didn't believe it. They're walking and talking about Jesus. Jesus kind of pops in. He's out of context, like seeing your kindergarten teacher at Walmart. You're like, Mrs., what are you doing here? It just doesn't feel right. And so Jesus is out of context. They're not expecting him. They're talking to him, but they don't know it's Jesus. And he's trying to hear what they have to say. And finally, he says in Luke 24, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The missing sermon that we can't wait to hear when we're in heaven. How does the Old Testament show us Jesus? And we know some of the ways that he probably mentioned them. Within minutes of after the first sin in the fall, Genesis 3.15 has the first messianic prophecy. The, in the prophets, we have Isaiah 53 talking about our suffering servant. In the minor prophets, we see in, in Micah where he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And, and he walked them through the scriptures, showing them mostly how the Messiah had to suffer first and he would rule and reign later. God's word showed them the living word. And their whole attitude began to change. They finally understood the Bible's about Jesus. Jesus isn't dead. Maybe he's alive. And after they had basically communion together, it says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures with us? And that's the kind of thing that God wants to do in our lives. He wants your heart to just burn with a a holy fire as you're opening the scriptures and and seeing the love of God and seeing how he wants to mold you and change you and it can break you so much, but then you're reminded of his grace and his love and that he still accepts us in the beloved. What a great motivation to overcome these three obstacles of an attitude, our attention being off, and our actions being lazy. What a wonderful thing to arrive at the great treasure, which is the living word himself. You never just read this book trying to gain academic information. Academic information doesn't help anyone. Even the demons believe in Jesus and tremble. Academic information, but hopefully they're not our neighbors in the next next door mansion in heaven. And they're not because they don't believe in a way that transforms their lives, that shows sincerity. And so we come to this great treasure. What do we do with this great treasure? You know, we realize the word of God takes us directly to God himself and we can better our relationship with God. Well, the final passage we're going to look at is 2 Kings chapter 7. And what's happening here is that the Syrians are encamped against Jerusalem for a long time. And so there's a famine that's going on. And then there's these lepers that are outside of Jerusalem because they're lepers and they have to be set apart from them. And they're like, should we ask if we should go in in Jerusalem? But they don't have any food. In in fact, let's go over to the Syrians and let's ask them to have pity on us. Maybe they're going to recognize by looking at us we're not a threat. They'll give us some food and let us move on to somewhere that does have food that isn't under siege. So they make their trek out there. They're a bit nervous. They get there. The the Syrians are completely gone. God had caused them to hear the sound of chariots that night. They thought that the Israelites had hired the Egyptians. They took off so quick that they left all the food there and all the spoil there. So the lepers not only start eating the food, but see gold and silver, and they start burying it behind the trees. But then they recognize that they're not doing the right thing, and they say this. They said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. They recognize they had come across a treasure, and they were hoarding it. And sometimes we come across a treasure and we realize God is in this word. God's word directs me directly to his heart. And yet we don't tell anyone. 
we keep it to ourselves and our devotions get better and better and, and other people are being distracted or have a bad attitude about the word or are lazy towards the word and they, they haven't found the treasure yet. And so if you've found the treasure, if you've recognized what it means to be in a relationship with God and how God's word can strengthen that relationship, then you need to tell somebody. You need to tell your kids that family devotions are no longer optional. It doesn't matter when sports are, there's family devotions that are happening. You need to tell your spouse saying, you know what, we are going to have couples devotions. This is going to keep our marriage together. You need to tell yourself that your quiet time with the Lord needs to be a bigger priority in your life. And you need to tell somebody else who doesn't believe in God that they're looking for satisfaction in all the right places. They're going to find the treasure that they're looking for in Christ found through his word. But that's not a natural thing for us to do. Job says, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And we've got to beg the Lord to give us the same heart that we would rejoice at his word as one who finds great treasure. 